There are billions of us on this planet. It's hard to believe we all came from one man and one woman. But we did. Who were they? When and where did they live? Jewish, Christian, and Muslim traditions trace us all back to Adam and Eve. The book of Genesis says they came from a place called Eden, near the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, somewhere in the ancient Near East. No one has yet found the location of the Garden of Eden, though many have tried. But why do we want to find it? Well, the reason is interesting. The Garden of Eden doesn't just represent the beginning of humanity. It is the beginning of our conversation with God. And finding out when and where that took place would tell us an awful lot about who we are. The big challenge on whether or not we can defend what the Bible says about Adam and Eve, where we take the biblical creation text as literal rather than as simply as figures of speech or talking about a completely different theological theme, really has to do with the date. And, uh, you know, I, I remember a few weeks ago I was with Fuzz Rana uh, as we traveled up to Vancouver and I spoke to the theologians at Regent uh, Seminary and also at Trinity Western uh, uh, International University and those are probably the two places in North America where you've got a really strong contingent of theologians saying that uh, we cannot take what the Bible says about Adam and Eve literally anymore because of the fact that it's quite clear that human genomics establishes a date for the birth of Adam and Eve that's incompatible with the literal reading of the Bible and also especially incompatible with the idea that the entire human species is descended from two people. And that's really the crux of the debate. Can we defend what the Bible says that the entire human species can be traced back to one couple, uh, a literal Adam and Eve, that lived at a historical time in the relatively recent past. That's part of the debate. The other part of the debate is can we defend what the Bible says concerning the timing of when God created Adam and Eve. And so this is what I want to look at. What does the Bible say about the date for Adam and Eve? What does the scientific evidence of Book of Nature say about the date for Adam and Eve? And what does the Bible say about us being descended from two individuals, Adam and Eve, and how does that uh, can be reconciled, we know, uh, from the study of uh, genomics and other disciplines of science. Now, there's been this uh, presumption that the Bible teaches that the Garden of Eden is in Mesopotamia, and we're talking a few thousand years ago. And what I'm going to suggest is that the Bible actually gives us a different story than that, and this is going to really help in reconciling the book of nature and the book of Scripture. How do we know they existed? And it's really interesting because the evidence that they existed is you and me. It's the people in the world today. We look at the genetic structure of the human population as it exists today, and it speaks to us of the literal Adam and Eve. It's really, really exciting. Now, all of us have a tiny chromosome in our body called the mitochondrial chromosome, and we only get it from our mother. It's not passed on through the father. And so uh, it's, it's acknowledged by all geneticists that everybody on this planet got their mitochondrial chromosome from a single woman, and tongue-in-cheek, they call her mitochondrial Eve. But she is exactly what you'd expect from the biblical Eve, the mother of us all. And so, basically, we have nearly identical mitochondria, and the few mutations that we have that differ from Eve's sequence are so few in number that they could arise in the relatively recent past. So you can just, if you just Google mitochondrial Eve and look at the Wikipedia can, uh, link, mm -hmm. you'll see that this is described. The only discordance between a biblical Eve and the evolutionary Eve is the exact dating. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't have time to go into it, but basically their dating method is wrong. Okay. There's a simpler dating method that gives you an early date. So mitochondrial Eve is awesome. Uh, and it's totally to the uh, totally points to scriptural Eve. Um, same story is happening on the male side, and that is all men have Y chromosomes, which they receive from their fathers, and all humanity 
uh, all male humanity traced back to a single man. And again, tongue in cheek, the evolutionists call him Y chromosome Adam. Mm -hmm. But he has all the attributes that we would expect of the biblical Adam, except that they would use a different a dating method that's flawed, which leads them to think that, um, that Adam lived long ago. But uh, there's new evidence that points to a recent Adam as well. So just one more point on this issue. Um, for over 10 years, it's been contested. Uh, y chromosome Adam and mitochondrial Eve uh, were not partners. They did not have children together. They weren't married. Uh, because they, they're using their dating methods, they had like a 100,000 year gap between them. Yeah. It's hard to have children if you don't live, uh, if you live 100,000 <laughs> years apart. So um, the interesting thing is if you go to Y Chromosome Adam on Wikipedia and read about it, they say the dating methods have changed and now they live in the same dating period. Fascinating. So yeah, that argument is gone. It's dead. These mutations originating in Africa appear on every Y chromosome in every man in the world today. These are the universal mutations we've been looking for. We followed the DNA trail all the way to the bottom of the tree. Every branch leads to one man, one Y chromosome. There must have been one man gave rise to all men alive today. He is the ultimate super ancestor. Uh, Adam and Eve are the only spirit beings that God created on earth. Uh, it's not the only spirit beings he created. He also created angels. Uh, but we are the only spiritual beings that God created uh, that are constrained to the physics of this universe. Uh, the angels are not constrained by the physics of this universe. They have a separate realm from ours. And unlike us, they can come into our realm and leave our realm uh, under God's uh, control. Uh, but we are constrained to the physics of uh, this universe. So we're not like the angels where we can come and go. We are indeed constrained. Uh, but we're the only spiritual beings uh, that, that God has created uh, that are constrained to this universe. And the Bible teaches that Adam and Eve are the progenitors of all humans which means we're all related, okay? We're all brothers and sisters uh, because we can all uh, trace our uh, descent back to one couple, Adam and Eve. Now, the reason we're spending some time on this, these three doctrines are being seriously challenged by people doing research, particularly on uh, human genomics. And there are people arguing for the first time in the history of the church that we have to abandon what the Bible teaches about the origin of human beings, either treat these passages in Romans and uh, Genesis, for example, as uh, figures of speech or dealing with a completely different topic. And so, for example, there's been a number of books published in the past five years uh, by Christian theologians making the point that uh, we need to reinterpret the Bible and really look at these texts on Adam and Eve as texts that are not dealing with physical or natural history, but really have a different point altogether. Now, you know, as an evangelist, I have a problem with that because whenever I put Genesis 1, for example, in front of a non-Christian who's never read the Bible before or has never been to church before and ask the question, take a look at this, is this talking about natural history or not? I've yet to meet such an individual who would say, no, it's not talking about natural history. The only people I meet who say that it's not talking about natural history are Christians concerned that they can't scientifically defend what the biblical text talks about. And mainly it's because uh, they fail to follow the scientific method. And I like to tell theologians when I'm on uh, seminary campuses that uh, we need to call this the biblical testing method because the truth is the scientific method came straight from the pages of scripture. Uh, and I wish that would be taught more in the university system because I run into a lot of scientists who have no idea where the scientific method came from. Uh, you know, they don't even figure out it came out of Reformation Europe. And you know, that much is obvious. The scientific method came out of Reformation Europe. Well, you would think the Reformation would have had something to do with the scientific method if indeed that's the time and the location of the birth of the scientific method. And indeed, that is the case. What happened in the Reformation is that 
people began to publish Bibles in the languages of the people. People began to read the Bible for themselves. They got away from the idea that the priest was the only one qualified to read the Bible. Everybody had access to the Bible, and that included people who were interested in natural history. And as they looked at what the Bible said about natural history, they noted that the Bible, first of all, commanded objective testing in many places, and then actually showed us how to objectively test uh, different parts of Scripture and different parts of the book of nature, and that was the birth of the scientific method. So the way uh, that uh, the conventional approach to dating Adam and Eve is uh, to use the molecular clock approach, and the molecular clock approach says mutations accumulate in a clock-like way. Mm -hmm. And so the more time, the more mutations accumulate. So uh, if we compare our genomes to the uh, Y chromosome and the mitochondria of Adam and Eve, and we measure how much difference there is, and if we know the rate of the molecular clock, then we can calculate how long ago Adam and Eve lived. That's the, that's the basic concept. And um, my colleague Rob Carter and I have been studying this using a very straightforward use of the molecular clock, using the known mutation rates for the Y chromosome and the mitochondrial chromosome, and, uh, and knowing the actual how many mutations have accumulated since Adam and Eve. And what we see is we get very biblical dates, both for Adam and Eve. Mm -hmm. and, we, and it's very important that those are two separate calculations and, and based upon two very different chromosomes. And so they, they both agree on, and give us biblical dates, which is really exciting. The conventional uh, evolutionary uh, scientists would use a somewhat different method of using the molecular clock. They don't use the actual known mutation rate, which is something we can measure in the present. Instead, they use a theoretical mutation rate. It's a mutation rate that's actually tenfold off in terms of it's tenfold slower. So they're like they've chosen to use a molecular clock that's only theoretical. There's no data for it. They just um, have on a theoretical basis assumed a mutation rate that's tenfold too low. Which lengthens the time. It, it gives you a date that's <laughs> roughly tenfold longer than yeah. a straightforward use of the molecular clock. And so um, the way they calculate the theoretical uh, clock is it's based upon evolutionary assumptions. So they say, we know that humans diverged from chimpanzees about six million years ago. And so we do our calculations based upon how long that, um, how many mutations have accumulated during that time. And then uh, they you know, divide by six million and they come up with a, a mutation rate. Mm -hmm. But it's based upon not measured mutation rates in the present, it's based upon historical assumptions and inferences. So it's not a reliable way of dating, which is why their dates jump around. Mm -hmm. Their dates have changed dramatically over the years. Um, most significantly, the most recent dates show that uh, even by evolutionary uh, dating methods, that Adam and Eve lived at the same period of time, roughly. Wow. So there's no problem with Adam and Eve uh, having uh, lived in the same era and been married and given rise to children. Now, if you're actually trying to go to the Bible and come up with an actual date for Adam, uh, the only database you've got are two genealogies, Genesis 5 and Genesis 11. The problem with those two genealogies, like all genealogies in the Bible, is that they're incomplete. Uh, no genealogy in the Bible is exhaustively uh, complete. And this is where I think there's been uh, some misunderstanding of how to reconcile the book of nature and the book of scripture are people looking at Genesis 5 and Genesis 11 and saying, well, actually, if you read the text there, uh, it talks about Adam being born. He lives for a certain number of years, and he gives birth to a son, Seth. And then Seth lives so many years, and he gives birth to a son. And if you actually add up all the years, it's 1,656 years uh, between Adam and between Noah. And then you look at the uh, generations in Genesis 11, from Noah to Abraham. Again, we're looking at uh, just a little less than a thousand years uh, to get down to Abraham. And uh, Abraham lived about 4,000 years ago. And this is where people get the idea uh, that Adam must have been created in 4004 BC. Uh, in fact, uh, John Lightfoot uh, in the Reformation era 
uh, based on his studies of the historical uh, records of the Bible, said it was 4004 BC, October 23rd, 9 a.m. Greenwich Mean Time. <laughs> so, and uh, one of his peers said, "Well, couldn't you pin it down a little more accurately than that?" <laughs> so, now. What is not recognized amongst English language readers, and by the way, uh, I've done a study on this, and the only places I've found in terms of theological research where people establish a date of like 4004 BC, it's always English language theologians. So, for example, you've got uh, Usher, James Usher, and you've got uh, uh, John Lightfoot, uh, both calculating a 4004 uh, BC date. But notice they're both English theologians. And if you actually look at it in the original Hebrew, uh, the word for father, uh, Ab, can also mean grandfather, great-grandfather, great-great-grandfather, etc. That's not the case with English. So, for example, people read Genesis 5, and it says the father. Well, they presume that's got to be the immediate uh, male ancestor of that particular son. And by the way, it's also true the word for son. The word son is ben, and in Hebrew, there's no distinction between a son, a grandson, a great-grandson, or a great-great-great-great-great-great-great-grandson. I mean, they all uh, would be uh, translated into the one word ben. And so this is a a problem uh, for English language readers, and it's a problem that stems from the fact that we are used to an enormous vocabulary. And one of the problems of trying to interpret the Old Testament from an English language perspective, Biblical Hebrew is one of the smallest vocabulary languages that has ever been invented. If you don't count the names of people and the names of cities and towns, you're looking at 3,000 words. Whereas in English, you're looking at 4 million words if you don't count the names of people and the names of cities and towns. It's still 4 million words. Uh, a single pair that populated uh, these, this entire earth. Some would contend that it took several hundreds or several thousand pairs to explain uh, the genetic differences. Uh, what would you say uh, are the main differences amongst those who would believe in original Adam and Eve versus those who would say, well, it took several pairs mm-hmm. to seed this earth? Right. So there's two aspects to this. One is, uh, what is the theological implications, Mm -hmm. and secondly, what does the scientific evidence show? And so let me uh, begin by talking about the theological implications. Um, If Adam and Eve were not literally true, but some type of uh, either a myth or some type of symbol, um, then really you lose the fall. Mm -hmm. And the fall is the reason for the cross. The fall is the explanation for death and suffering and evil. And so you're, you're paying a very high price to try to reconcile evolutionary theory with scripture. It's, it's, it, scripture pays a dear price. And so this is something that I believe represent a, a, a step too far. It compromises scripture so fundamentally that I think that it's, um, it has to be rejected just by, by, by to honor scripture and to honor you know, the revelation that comes to us through Jesus. Uh, scientifically, the argument that's been offered that we, we can't accept literal Adam and Eve because two people could not generate enough genetic diversity to explain the human race as we see it is, uh, is not correct. And I don't believe it even reflects very careful consideration genetically. Um, if you have, uh, even today, uh, a man and a woman get married, they can have millions and millions of children and um, no two children will be identical. This is because they're heterozygous. That is, um, you know, a man has a set of chromosomes from his mom and a set of chromosomes from his dad, and they differ by about four million locations. There's, so there's built-in diversity at four different four million sites within the genome of an average person. If a man and a woman marry between them, they can explain eight million variants. There's only about 15 million uh, single nucleotide variants in the whole human population. Mm-hmm. Two people can explain uh, most of that. Mm-hmm. Can so um, so basically, uh, if God created Adam and Eve to be heterozygous, which would be good design, uh, because you want diversity in the human race, uh, you could have as much human diversity and more than we have today 
in their first family. So it doesn't take time. You see, you don't have to explain diversity in terms of mutations mm -hmm. because diversity can be designed and built into the first couple. Okay. And so uh, that whole argument is has to be just totally rejected. It's not even scientifically reasonable. It's like it hasn't doesn't reflect very careful thought about uh, how how diversity could arise. Something else you can pick up too is that if you compare Genesis 5 genealogy to the Genesis 11 genealogy, there's exactly 10 names in each list. Now, what is the probability that you would be breaking it between Adam and Noah and Noah and Abraham and coming up with exactly 10 names in each? Okay, that should give you a little clue. Then you look at the other genealogies and you notice that pattern repeats. So when you look at the genealogy, for example, uh, in uh, Luke, uh, it breaks it down into three components. Uh, and it's three sets of 14 names. But if you compare the Luke genealogy, you know, this is interesting. The Luke genealogy is more complete than the Genesis uh, 5 genealogy. Uh, but the genealogies and chronicles are more complete than the Luke genealogy. So in uh, Luke, uh, you've got uh, you know, three sets of 14. In Chronicles, you've got way more uh, than those names uh, listed. And so in some cases, four names get dropped between a father and a son, which is okay because, after all, the word son uh, can mean grand, great, great grandson. So having three names missing is no big deal. But this is a pattern you see in the biblical genealogies. They like equal numbers. And so three sets of 14, two sets of 10. So that would tell you, okay, just like the three sets of 14 that you see in Luke, a whole lot of names got dropped uh, in the uh, actual uh, genealogy. Uh, the two sets of 10 that you see in Genesis, chances are a bunch of names got dropped there as well. Now, Genetics can date the ancient Y chromosome mutations to calculate the age of scientific Adam. Wells believes he was born around 60,000 years ago. It sounds ancient, but it means our search for a common ancestor has not led us all the way back to a time of ape men, or even to primitive beings like Homo erectus. Compared to the billions of years of human evolution, we found Adam in the recent past. Genesis 5 and 11 genealogies. Are there any individuals in those genealogies where we've got dates uh, from outside the Bible? You know, there's extra biblical evidence that establishes when these individuals lived. Well, you do. There's two individuals, Abraham and Peleg. Abraham is the last one mentioned in the Genesis 11 genealogy. Peleg is number five in the list of the ten names from Noah down to Abraham. And for Abraham, his name is mentioned in the Sumerian and Akkadian genealogical records. And by the way, the Bible is not the only place where you get a genealogy for the first humans. You also have the Sumerians and the Akkadians giving a similar uh, genealogy. And by the way, the Bible is not the only book that says that there were people living hundreds of years in the days before the flood. Again, both the Akkadian and Sumerian tablets claim that there was an ancient line of kings, patriarchs if you like, uh, that were living much longer than people live today. Now, it's a little bit different in the Bible, and they claim that their ancient line of kings in the days before the flood were living more than a thousand years each. In fact, in some cases they had them living almost 10,000 years. And so people say, well, that's not surprising. Uh, we have other evidence that the Akkadian and Sumerians distorted uh, their history. This is just simply a distortion. What we have in the Bible is the actual real numbers. Uh, but nevertheless, it shows that the Bible is not alone in claiming that people in the days before the flood lived a long time. And it really would explain why human uh, society was able to uh, develop so quickly. If you've got people living for many, many generations, that means you've got a stream of knowledge that can be passed on generation after generation after generation. You know, I wish I could talk to my grandfather, but uh, uh, he died when my father was five. And uh, so that counsel and wisdom never got to, brought down to me, but it would have been different if he had lived. 
and it really is a real help if you've got uh, people living a long time in terms of being able to advance uh, civilization. And so trying to explain why uh, human civilization uh, did advance at the, the rate that it did uh, would fit people actually living that long. Okay, uh, Abraham, uh, we know from the Akkadian Sumerian uh, tablets, lived about 4,000 years ago. And by the way, if you look at the historical records past Genesis 11, they tell you about Abraham down to Jesus. And it comes out to about 2,000 years. Again, if you look at the different historical records, uh, you'll get a date. And so the dates agree. He lived about 4,000 years ago. Uh, Peleg, we know, lived about 11,000 years ago. And I'm a little bit out of time, so I'm going to have to cover this next time. But what does it say in Genesis 10:25? The world was divided in the days of Pelic. And what I'm going to show you next week is evidence that we have from a geology of how the continents of the world were joined together at the close of the last ice age. And with the melting of the ice from the last ice age, the continents became separated. The world was divided in the days of Pelic. And we actually can date that with considerable precision as to when the land bridges joining the continents broke. There is a bridge that joined England, for example, to France, a bridge that joined Siberia to Alaska. And by the way, that bridge wasn't a small bridge. It was 500 miles wide. It was a big bridge. And we can date when that bridge broke and when it became impossible uh, for pre-Industrial Revolution humans to travel from Siberia to Alaska or Alaska to Siberia. But we can document this around the world. And by the way, we're looking at sea level rises of, a, of, of a, over 500 feet that took place in a relatively short period of time. So we'll look at the geology that shows this, but most importantly, you get a date. We can pin down a date for when the world was divided in the days of Peleg. And if we know when Peleg lived, and we know when Adam lived, and if the lifespans recorded in the text are proportional to the passage of time, then that puts Adam's birthday at roughly 60,000 years ago give or take 30,000 years. Just